This morning I'm going to teach you a new language. I'd like you to repeat after me, sapato. Sapato. Fasta. Sapato. Lele. Together, sapato lele. That's how we greet each other and say happy Sabbath in my language. How does it go again? You better remember because I'll ask pastor and the elders to lock the doors after church. If you can't remember, we won't have lunch until you share it with me. It's good to be here with you and uh, I bring you greetings uh, from my family as well. And part of the South Pacific, the rest of our South Pacific family right across our division. I've... uh, as Pastor mentioned, I will be sharing with you some an exciting stories of what's happening, what's been happening in God's church, our church globally. I've got a couple of stories from within the South Pacific as well. Uh, if you want the exciting stories from Australia, be at the constituency meeting tonight and tomorrow. <laughs> Pastor Terry will share some exciting stories from there. And I've got a message as well to help us. Did you know that during the height of the pandemic, you know, when everybody was trying to make sense of what's happening to the world, actually, study after study shows that religious faith became stronger. Right across the world, in fact, one study showed that there was a 27% hike in interest of people wondering, is there other meaning to this? Is there more meaning to life? As a church, we had to pivot and find new ways of doing things. And this has actually been very encouraging. And in my opinion, uh, even though you know, parts of the pandemic, the lockdowns were difficult for us, it actually, we are actually quite advanced now uh, as a church because of uh, some of the uh, restrictions that came with COVID. And so we had to find new ways of doing things. I remember back then, our pastors, we had to put them through a crash course about how to use Zoom. One of the pastors, I remember him sharing his feedback with us. He pastored some of the churches back in Christchurch, and he said he got everybody up on Zoom, and he had to spend about half an hour trying to tell people how to just mute their microphones. Everybody was so excited to see each other and greeting each other. And if you're looking after 200 odd members, it might take you a while to actually get started. So yeah, we, we've had to pivot. Look at this. With online searches, there's been a huge hike in interest of people checking out what's happening online. Okay, we, church, we must remember church is not just about gathering here together. Church is not just about the building. There are other platforms where we can actually engage people and uh, connect with them. Um, Adventist World Radio ran a series calling called Unlocking Bible Prophecy. Five million viewers in some parts of the world. And in the Philippines alone, 10,000 people were added to God's church. Amen. In Tanzania, they ran a uh, three-week evangelistic satellite program. They had 30,000 baptisms. The, in the, uh, across the world, we actually added close to 2,000 new churches during the pandemic. Can I hear an amen? Amen. I wanted to share this with us today because, you know, sometimes we can feel a bit discouraged with what's going on. But actually, there's been a lot of amazing things where we as a church, when we reflect upon, we can't help but just conclude that God is in charge of his church and amazing amazing things are happening. Close to a million members added globally. This was, now, this news is uh, over a year old now, but it's, it's uh, quite exciting what, some of what's uh, being shared with us. But you know, it wasn't all good news. I find it, found it challenging sitting at the annual council when we found out that over 17,000 members, and we believe these figures are conservative, lost their lives as a result of COVID. The most moving for me was watching a reel that was shared about some of our workers on the front line, pastors, retirees, church workers, health workers, who in the course of serving people during this difficult time actually lost their lives. Church family, 
with all the conspiracies that are out there, let me tell you, COVID is real. And it's had a major impact. And it was quite staggering for me, you know, as they shared images and portraits of people, selected people globally who had lost their lives, their names, their picture, their designation, their years of service, some of them were still very young. But you know, I, I thank the guy who came up and uh, did an appeal for ADRA. Sometimes we wonder where our offerings go. Check this out. Between 2018, 2019 and 2020, more than $650 million was expanded for ADRA activities around the world. You and I are not part of some congregational church where this is all we, you know, this is all we know. No, no, we are part of a global church. And I have to add here that we know that uh, there's uh, significant funds there that's not all ours, that partner other governments and NGOs partner with us as well. But this impacted more than 34 million people during the pandemic. Amen? Thank you for supporting the church and its various initiatives. In India, you remember at the height of the pandemic, what was their problem? Oxygen, they were running thin. Did you know that ADRA helped supply oxygen tanks and generators as well? This morning I've entitled my message, A Chosen Generation. And I want to put up front here, this is not a, a message filled with guilt to make us to somehow jolt us into mission and uh, being involved with the church, I don't believe, believe in that. It's one thing to be encouraged to reach out and introduce people to Jesus. I think part of the challenge is how do we do it? And so this morning, my main text is from 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 to 17, uh, uh, just a couple of verses there. But I'm going to ask you if you can please read the text on the screen and participate with me this morning. Let's read together. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into this marvelous light. I don't know about you, but you know, this is pretty special. The fact that we are God's chosen people. We are special in his eyes. Turn to the person next to you and tell them that they are special. Do we be actually believe it? So special that God himself came and died so that we can have life. And I like the part where he talks about, and as a result of what our living relationship with him Part of what we do as a result of a walking, loving relationship with Jesus is that we proclaim, we tell the story, we can't help but share what's happening in our lives with people around us. So my message this morning, I'll be focusing on the testimony of David. Why did I choose David? Because David is a colorful character and he sometimes reminds me of myself. And also, I, have, I will also bring us some, uh, some of the how when we reflect on the life of Paul who was writing to young Timothy, gave, gave him just some tips. Now, this is not an exhaustive uh, um, discussion today about how we can be a chosen generation, but just some selected uh, principles and, and uh, points that you and I can take away. The first one is this. Can you remember the time when David sinned? When we think of the, the King David, what thoughts come to mind? What pictures? Very quickly. Talk to me. Bathsheba. Bathsheba. Wow. Straight to Bathsheba. Yes. What happened? Was David in the right place? Uh, he was supposed to be at war. And then he went searching where he shouldn't have been. And, you know, I had an uncle who told me, and his son, who's a pastor as well back home, he said, you know, when theology and biology meet son, what do you think happens? This is not in the, the this is not in the testimony, it's not in the spirit of prophecy, it's not in, what happens when theology and biology meet? He said, biology always wins. Don't fool around, my son. 
David fell. And then he tried to cover up his sin by what? Committing many other sins, including the death of somebody, of other people. Do you think the whole of the, the, the town knew about this? You know, sin is something that we can't hide. By the way, that does not mean that we should be out digging up what so-and-so has done. No, stay away. Just focus on what we've done. Okay, life for each of us alone is difficult as it is. So he messes up big time. The whole world knows about it. Everybody tell a man and tell a woman's going hot. And then look at his prayer. I love his prayer. Let's read together. His expression. I think we can pick a picture of God here. Let's read. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion. Blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my sin is always before me. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. What picture of God do you have this morning? What do you think worship was like in the Garden of Eden? Yes, it would have been beautiful. Very different from the worship we have today. And I think, I, I can't wait for when we get to heaven. I think Adam and Eve just loved it when God was there present with them in person. Would have been amazing. And the picture that we have of God can affect us eternally. Just family, please get this right. I love what he shares. And we know that David was somebody who walked with God. Yes, he messed up big time, but God himself shares through his servant in the book of Hebrews that David was a man after his own heart. And if God says it, the rest of us can, can zip this one and just let God be God. That gives you and I hope. But look at the pictures that he shares with us. He says that he is a, what are some of the attributes we see there? That God is, it's right there on the screen. Merciful, thank you. Unfailing in love. I've got grown up children as I showed you earlier. And you know, by and large, my children are really good children. I thank God for them. And I have a beautiful wife as well. But you know what? Sometimes we test each other. I cannot say to you that my love for my children is unfailing. I'm limited. But our God's love to us, I cannot fully explain. It's unfailing. He's great and, in, and compassionate. We can't understand, we can't fully explain the love of God. Even when we get to heaven, we'll be learning about this for the rest of eternity. What picture of God do we have? It affects the way we also live our life here in this world. And then I like the second part. He knows he's messed up. He's thankful that God has forgiven him. And then he says, create in me a new heart, O Lord. Signifying two important points, church family. Number one, we believe in justification. As, slow, as soon as we accept Jesus, we are saved. Can I hear an amen? amen. There's no sin that we have committed that's, that God cannot forgive. Irrespective of what our past has been like, if it was like David, worse than David, when we come to Jesus, he does forgive us. And the thing that I love about him as well is he doesn't just leave us there. He doesn't just say, okay, I've wiped out the past. I'm giving you a chance and I'm standing here with a stick. I'm going to be walking right behind you just to watch when you fall so that I can give you a whooping. David tells us, create in me a new heart. God gives us the Holy Spirit, to enable us in our work. That's amazing. He doesn't just leave us on our own. And there are things that you and I can never believe that we can ever do, but by the grace of God and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, we can live a life where people look back and say, what's happened to you? I share this. 
because I have seen too often a wrong view of God affects how people live their lives here in this world. Secondly, the second thing that we hear from David in Psalms 139, and I'd like all the ladies, please, to read this text for us. Two, three. Once in, at Fulton, Fulton College, a young man, there was this young lady that he really admired. But he didn't have the courage or the know-how as to how to approach this young lady. They had a week of prayer. And on a particular day, he, was, he came and said, they were friends, but he just couldn't just didn't know how to tell her that she was fearfully and wonderfully made, you know. <laughs> and then the preacher says, turn to the person next to you and tell them that Jesus loves you. And then he had, I'm not sure what type of inspiration, but he thought, this is my chance. And he turns over to the girl, and the young boys who are here, I'm not telling you how to do it. He says to her, Jesus loves you, but I love you more. <laughs> Each of us who are sitting here today are fearfully and wonderfully made. Just family, I, I stand up the front and sometimes people think, look at us as ministers and you think that we are walking in the clouds right next to God, guess, guess what? We're just the same as you. We haven't got it all together. It was only in the last 10 years that I finally fully understood and appreciated this. He writes in Psalms 139, well after Psalms 51, and he's able to come to the place where he's able to say, you know what? Yeah, I've messed up, but I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I'm going to ask you this morning, please don't confess to us. If you were to be honest with yourself right now, how do you rate yourself? You see, sometimes we, allow, we look at ourselves through the, through the lens of other people. Maybe things that were said to us when we were growing up, I know that was my case, grew up in a very dysfunctional home. By the way, I've forgiven people, I've moved on. We can't choose where we come from, but we can choose where we're going, amen? And we also can choose to hold on to things in the past or choose to give it to Jesus and live a life that is so different so that we can say, like I can in the last 10 years, that yes, you know what? I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I am special. I'm not better than others, but I am special in the eyes of Jesus. And if that is from our God and our Savior, that's enough for me. And the world can say whatever they want and want me to live up to the Joneses and dress a certain way, look a certain way. I don't have any hair, but that's okay. I'm still fearfully and wonderfully made. This is vitally important. Making sure that our understanding of salvation, our picture of God is correct. And also accepting who we are in Jesus. You are special. This young man, now I'm switching to the Paul, uh, Timothy's uh, uh, message, the message to Timothy now. His, uh, Fiji has now returned from the uh, Rugby Sevens World Cup. And he was one of the players, the only Sevens player in the world to have won two Olympic gold medals and a World Cup. No other player on the, earth, in, on the earth. He's one of the most loved people back home. But you know what, when he was growing up, he came from a very simple, basic family. And as he was growing up, you know, he, he came home and he realized that there were certain things that he was not good at. And then he told his parents, who were struggling just to put food on the table, I believe he, he wanted to be a rugby player. You know what the parents did? 
They struggled just to get him a pair of rugby boots. But they invested in him. When Paul writes to Timothy, the message can, which is applicable to you and I today, it says, command and teach these things. Don't let anyone look down on you because of, because of you, because you are young or because of your skin color or because of your education level. We can contextualize it into your own this morning. Stay focused. Stay focused. Don't let the others around us, don't let social media, don't try to be like somebody else. I love the story of David. Remember when he went to war and Saul should have been strong enough to take on Goliath because Saul himself was a giant, feels for the young Pathfinder aged boy, gives him his armor and all of that. And what does David say? I'm not Saul. I'm going to fight in my own armor. Another good counsel about how we can be good ambassadors or part of that royal priesthood that we talked about earlier is to be an example. Let's read together. But set an example for the believers in speech. Let your actions do the talking. The most powerful sermons that we can preach is not that we know all of the information here back to front. It's not that we can recite the 2,300 day prophecy back to front. It's not about the amount of argumentative points that we can prove that the seventh day is the, actually the true Sabbath. Our five major teachings as Adventists. It's not about all of those things. The most powerful message that we can ever preach is to live the life. So that when people look at us, there is something different about you. Recently, a... Uh, person that I have huge respect for, passed away. Massive funeral. It was also put online, so many people. And I've attended many meetings since then where people have taken out time to acknowledge this person who lived this type of life. Sometimes we are too fast to try and, you know, Convert people with, with our teachings. And please, I'm, I'm not going against our teachings. I love the Adventist message. I didn't grow up as an Adventist. I became an Adventist because of the, the, not only the messages that made sense to me. They're biblically sound. I left church in my teenage years, around 16, 17 because of people who mistreated us when the church started to become legalistic. It lost its focus. Many of us left church, but I came back because of godly people who I met, who continued to live the life in it and be Christ-like in the way they treated us. Amen? You see, information is just here. Those are just the facts. But how we treat people helps the information to move from here to here. Be an example. It's no point keeping the Sabbath and during the week, the people around us, we're just the same. But may we be the people when this whole world seems to be falling apart, they turn and they see, they look at us and say, what is it about you that you, 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 you're at peace? I know that your family is struggling, but I still hear you people singing and, you know, you people are happy and content. The fruits of the Spirit is the things they see in us. That's contagious. Today, on social media, they have uh, what they call influencers. 
And some of these people, it's quite an interesting life that they live. They have millions of followers around the world. As the international borders started to open, Fiji, uh, the, uh, uh, um, partnered with some of them. They went to Fiji, and you know, that was to help influence tourism. But church family, I want us to be genuine influencers. We don't have to have a social media account, and uh, it's not about how many likes we have or how many followers we have. It's not about how many friends we have on, on social media. It's not about all those things. We each can be an influencer within the circle of influence that God has blessed you to be part of. And here he says, watch your life and doctrine closely. Let's read together. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them, because if you do so, you will save both yourself and your hearers. What is he saying here? He's saying here that if what we talk about, what we espouse, it must be in sync with the way we live our lives. That's when it becomes powerful. And as I said earlier, we have an amazing message. Not one to make us proud. It tells us where we come from. There wasn't a big bang. Scripture is very clear. It tells us where we come from, what went wrong, how Jesus intervened. He's gone away, what he's doing, the things that will happen. But the most important thing, and then he's coming again soon. I can't wait for that day. It gives us, we, we have a health message as well. We have all kinds of messages that changes our life significantly. Jesus wants us to live a life more and abundantly. And we can be influencers of that when those things are in sync with each other. I love this. This is my last uh, uh, text for this morning. This is the old man, Timothy, sorry, Paul, writing to the young man. The next generation. Let's read what he says. To Timothy, my true son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I love the language. He says, Timothy, my true son. That was not his biological son. Timothy was, uh, Paul was a famous, he was a household name in the church back then. He was the best preacher, that, one of the best preachers that was around. Everybody wanted a piece of him. But he took time to invest in other people as well. Church, church family, I thank God that as I look around today, I see we have children and we have young people. One of the greatest needs that our young people need today is supportive adults. What did I say? Supportive adults. I'm going to make a confession here. Can you keep a secret? Yes or no? Hurry up, it's, we want to have lunch. Can you keep a secret? Can I trust you? No. <laughs> you know, I, I feel ashamed to share this. There was a time I used to come to church for lunch. <laughs> Why do you think I came to church for lunch? <laughs> yes, always good food, yes. Pardon? Yeah, the, the, yes, the, the food was getting through for sure. I like the people. I was broke. I'd spent all my money the night before out clubbing with my friends. And to the young people who are here, there's no life there. 
You see, I came from a very dysfunctional and home, and as a result, became quite rebellious. I'm not proud of it. We were hungry. And there were this group of people in the church that I attended who met and had lunch every Sabbath. And it wasn't just me, there was a number of others. We were all related from the same island. No one ever told us off. I thank God for people who are Christ-like in the way they live their lives. Now that was more than 30 years ago. But you know what? In this world that we now live in, for some of you who have been around for a while, uh, getting close to retirement or are retired, when you went to school back in the day, for some of you, you didn't have to do high school. You could get a job. Am I correct? No longer the case today. Today, a lot of our young people need at least one, some even two degrees before they can get a job. And so the expectations on our young people is going through the roof. Are you following me? But the biggest challenge is where's the support going? I have found that when we rally, again, rally alongside our children and our young people, and in our Advent message, which is a beautiful one about how do we you know, prepare children, disciple them, it's the partnership of the home. It is the school as well, and it's also the church. But they need us like never before. Not there judging them with a big stick. Recently, um, well, one and a half years ago, we moved our membership to a church that was really struggling. In fact, not, not one and a half, yeah. And in fact, I almost ended up pastoring that church. It was a couple of years ago now because of COVID. And um, there, were ve very, there were barely a handful of young people in church. As soon as we were able to meet with bigger numbers, we met together. And I remember clearly we sat there in one of our church members whose uh, homes that has, uh, he owns a lifestyle block, lovely place. We had to still physically distance from each other, so you eat your lunch here and another group's there. And we, we got talking. And we decided to bring together three families that loved our young people, irrespective of how they were living their lives. And then we set aside every second Sabbath of the month, we would have lunch together in one of these three homes. And they could come, whether they had food or nothing, just come. We've started running out of space. Towards the end of last year, you know, of doing this, we've included a number of other families who just love on them. We had a discussion at the end of the year. We talked about, okay, how are we going to? What else? The young people want to be involved in the life of the church. They now can't keep up with the, the services that they have been asked to lead out in different churches around the conference. The next generation need us. I appeal to us, church family, that we also be like David, uh, sorry, like Paul, and intentionally make time for these loved ones. Look at our church programs. Look at our budgets. Who is it benefiting? If it's benefiting mainly us, the older folk, I remember visiting one of the churches. They were really concerned. At the end, I said to them, you know, I'm not really worried about you guys. I could say that because we were already close. We had a relationship. I said, what keeps me up at night is those that are not here, our children. Where are they? Invest in the next generation. Just coming to our, our no, I better close. Bring us back to our main text again. That you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, 
his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into this marvelous light. The best decision I ever made was to follow Jesus. Best decision I ever made. Best place to be is where Jesus wants you to be. Pastor, I never dreamt I would be a general secretary. Honestly speaking, I showed you a picture of home. If I had things my way, I'd be back home, still looking after my local church in my little tiny island. Best decision is to follow Jesus wholeheartedly. And it's the best place to be is where Jesus wants us to be. And you know, we don't have to make a grand appearance. We don't have to spend thousands of dollars. Today I've just shared with you some simple things that we can do that can help make a difference in introducing others to the God that you and I worship. The God that David so proudly talks about. The God who is full of compassion. The God who is loving. And the God who empowers us to live life not only here, but to share that with others around us. It's my prayer that God will bless you also in your journey, not only as a church, but individually and also as families. God bless you all.